If I blow up up here, it's that guy's fault back there. This could be a bomb. I don't know. He has said, stick it in your pocket. <laughs> Maybe he's a... Uh, He's ops or something in there. You know, this is a way to get rid of the fair tax people. I don't know. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity to address your group tonight. I have traveled two and a half hours for a subject that I hold very dear to my heart. Because I believe that this is the greatest country in the world. And if we don't make changes, it will be destroyed. We know that we cannot look to our present political system to do that. We have to make changes with grassroots. The Americans for Fair Tax would like me to get you to do nothing else tonight but to take what I say, compare it to what you know, and at least, I hope I spark enough interest that you will leave here tonight and do research on your own, because I'm sure if you do, that you too will come on board and help in the campaign to bring about the greatest change in this country since the American Revolution. However, if I leave here tonight and you believe that you just met the craziest SOB in the world, that's okay too, because I would consider myself in great company. After all, Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson and Sir Patrick Henry and all those guys were considered to be, shall we say, not quite right in their thinking. But all great things in this country have been hard fought for, from our declaring our independence to the abolishment of slavery. They were not things that came easily. This too shall come to pass. I want to ask you, how many of you have read this book? There's always one in every crowd. How many, are, how many are pleased with the current tax system? And how many of you believe that the fair tax will never be passed? The great philosopher George Santayana said that those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And Neil Borch wrote, when it comes to politicians' powers of taxation, the only limit that they recognize is the people's willingness to tolerate the confiscation of their wealth. I believe that these statements best describe how we have allowed ourselves to become slaves to a socialistic, draconian, unconstitutional tax system and what we need to do in order to rein in the freedom, regain the freedom and industrial vitality that this great, great nation once had. Let's take a brief look at, how, at our current tax system and how we got here. In the early years, the federal, only taxed, the federal government only taxed alcohol, carriages, and sugar, tobacco, a few of those items. But when we went to war, they needed more money. So they brought about and they placed taxes on luxury items to cover that cost. But by 1817, we had defeated Great Britain, and Congress did away with all internal taxes, and for all intents and purposes, they funded the government through tariffs on imports because most governing at that point was done on a local level. The first income tax came about to raise revenues for the Civil War. In 1861, Congress passed a 3% income tax on everyone earning between $600 to $10,000 a year. The rate eventually went to 5% and what also was added was inheritance tax as well as some sales and excise taxes. By 1872, the income tax had been eliminated. But the politicians' dreams of a permanent income tax was very much alive and well. Over the next 20 years, there were no less than 68 proposals to enact another income tax. During the second term of Grover Cleveland, the Panic of 1893 brought in the opportunity for the government to do just that. With the failure of the Reading Railroad going into receivership and the banks associated with them closing, they looked at it as a perfect opportunity to start raising money once again through an income tax. In 1894, the income tax was passed, and it was called, now quote, an act to reduce taxation, to provide revenue for the government and for other purposes. But this is an interesting thing about that proposal. All government officials, state and local, were to be exempt from that tax. Grover Cleveland believed that the tax was unconstitutional, but he let it become law without his signature. And when the income tax was challenged in the U.S. Supreme Court, 
they deemed that it in fact was unconstitutional, violating Article 1, Section 9. The Democrats had a taste of something that they really liked. And there was a conservative Democrat by the name of Joseph Bailey. Boy, if that's not an oxymoron. There was a conservative Democrat by the name of Joseph Bailey from Texas. And he came up with this brilliant plan. He thought, I can kill two birds with one stone. I'm going to show just how compassionate the Democrats are and what mean people the Republicans are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to propose that we have an income tax, even though I don't necessarily support it. But what the Republicans will do is they will fight it, and it will show that the Republicans are for the rich and the Democrats are for the poor. Well, it, it backfired. It absolutely backfired on it. The liberal, liberal Republicans, <clears throat> backed by Teddy Roosevelt, supported the bill. And the conservative Republicans said, there's no way that we will endorse this bill unless you can get a constitutional amendment saying that it's okay to have an income tax. And they figured no way would there ever be an amendment to impose a tax directly on the people. Another missed call. February 12, 1913, we all know what happens. The supposed 16th Amendment was supposedly ratified. The original tax, however, only affected a half of 1% of Americans and in today's dollars, you would have to earn $250,000 before you paid tax of 1% and a 7% tax if you made $6 million and up. In 2003, the top 52% of all income earners paid virtually 100% of all the personal income taxes collected by the IRS. To add insult to injury, withholding, which is the greatest flim-flam act since convincing people only the rich would be taxed, was instituted <clears throat> and has the ability to not only take your money, but confuses you into believing you actually get money back. The old system was paid once a year. You sit down at your table on May 15th, and you would send your check in to the government for your taxes. But to prove a point how deceiving that the withholding is, my daughter works for a payroll service. And she says it's absolutely amazing how many people do not know how much money they make. They only know what they take home. And when you say, what do you pay in taxes? Oh, I didn't pay anything. I got money back. Now that, my friend, is a great con job. It's also a myth that businesses are a good place to raise revenues because they can best afford it. Fact, corporations and businesses do not pay taxes at all. They are mere collection agencies passing that cost of the taxes on to the individuals. There is only one entity in this country that pays taxes and that is individuals. Any tax on a business are simply added into the cost of the product, or a reduction in dividends, a reduction in pay and benefits to the worker. In light of this fact, I find it absolutely mind-boggling that someone wants to vote for any politician who runs on the platform that they're going to raise business taxes. These myrmidons who promote this concept would do well to understand exactly what these politicians are saying. They're saying, I'm increasing your taxes. The compliance cost in terms of is estimated to be 6.2 billion hours. Now, compliance cost with the IRS is the time it takes you to fill out your tax forms. It's the time it takes you to keep your records. It's the time the businesses invest in keeping everything straight for the IRS and the current income tax system. That takes 6.2 billion hours alone in order to keep up with the compliance cost. And let's put that in perspective. Imagine taking 3.1 million people, putting them in a room and having them work 40 hours a week for 50 weeks a year. That's more people in this country than work in the auto industry, computer manufacturing industry, aircraft manufacturing industry, the talk radio and the steel industry combined. 3.1 million people doing nothing but 40 hours a week filling out paperwork for the IRS. Another way to look at it, if the average life expectancy is 76 years old, we're basically throwing away the lives of over 9,000 people. And let's not forget the 100,000 IRS agents costing over $10 billion per year. Embedded cost. 
The embedded cost of the tax system is a tax that you aren't even aware of because when you buy something, everything you buy, whether it's a cup of coffee at your local coffee shop, a brand new car, a house, when you go to the doctor, anything that you buy in this country has an embedded cost in it of a, between 23 to 28%. Now it's important that you keep those numbers in mind because we're going to get back to those in a little bit. 23 to 28% embedded cost in everything that you buy. A good example of an embedded cost is you take a loaf of bread. The loaf of bread starts with seeds that the farmer buys. The farmer grows the wheat. The wheat's sold. It goes and gets turned into flour. The flour goes to the baker. The baker makes the bread. The bread goes into a plastic bag. The bag gets a little plastic twi a twisty on it. Every one of those operations along the way has a little bit of tax that's in that cost of that loaf of bread. And when you get that loaf of bread off your shelf, if that loaf of bread is costing you a dollar, 22 cents of that dollar is taxes. <clears throat> These are just some of the more visible costs of the current income tax system. But let's talk for just one minute on a more important cost. The cost of loss of freedoms and the right to feeling secure in your home and business. Now folks, I'm going to read something here and I don't like to read, but if you find something that is stated so eloquently that you can't change it, why change what works, right? In 1953, or 1955, <clears throat> T. Coleman was the Internal Revenue Service Commissioner. And he wrote, and I quote, Congress went beyond merely enacting an income tax law and repealed Article 4 of the Bill of Rights. By empowering the tax collector to do the very things from which that article says we were to be secure. It opened our homes, our papers, and our effects to the prying eyes of government agents and set the stage for searches of our books and vaults and for inquiries into our private affairs whenever the taxmen might decide, even though there, were, there might not be any justification beyond mere cynical suspicion. The income tax is bad because it has robbed you and me of the guarantee of privacy and respect for our property that we were given to us in Article 4 of the Bill of Rights. This invasion is absolute and complete as far as the amount of tax that can be assessed is concerned. Please remember that under the 16th Amendment, Congress can take 100% of your income at any time it so desires. As a matter of fact, right now it is considering a tax as high as 91%. This was in 1955. This is downright confiscation and cannot be defended on any other grounds. The income tax is bad because it was conceived in class hatred. It is an instrument of vengeance and plays right into the hands of the communist. It employs the vicious communist principle of taking from each according to his accumulation of the fruits of his labor and giving to others according to their needs, regardless of whether those needs are the result of indolence or lack of pride, self-respect, personal dignity, or other attributes of men. As, a matter, as matters now stand, if our grandchildren make the most of their capabilities and training, they will have to give most of it to the tax collector and so become slaves of the government. People cannot afford to pull themselves up by the bootstraps anymore because the tax collector gets both the boots and the straps as well. The income tax is bad because it is oppressive to all, dis to all and discriminates particularly against those people who prove themselves most adept at keeping the wheels of business turning and creating maximum employment and a high standard of living for their fellow men. I believe that a better way to raise revenue not only can be found but must be found because I am convinced that the present system is leading us right back to the very tyranny from which those who establish this land of freedom risk their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to forever free themselves. Now I think that that base best states exactly what the income tax is. I like to use an acronym that I came up with and I call it ACID. A-C-I-D-D. -D. A. It is abusive. Agents run around with guns, armed with guns, confiscating homes, businesses, paychecks, and bank accounts, all without you ever having been afforded due process. It violates the founding principles of our Constitution on so many levels that it's hard to know where to begin. C. It is coercive. Through acts of intimidation and threats of imprisonment, it forces the American people into compliance. I. It is incomprehensible.
There are so many rules and regulations, over 2.1 million words alone, that even the IRS agents themselves will give you the wrong answer more than 47% of the time. D. It is divisive. It pits one class against another. It paints big business as the bad guy causing distrust and malcontent amongst the populace. A little side note here. I find it very disturbing that our politicians are involved with a system that blatantly wastes our hard-earned money, cannot account for billions of dollars spent, and yet these very political leaders remain unscathed. Then to add insult to injury, these same politicians sit on the committees which go after big business, business leaders for their lack of honesty. D, again, it is destructive. It makes criminals out of what ordinarily would be law-abiding citizens. It taxes hard work and punishes self-reliance and entrepreneurship. It discourages growth in the business world, but more importantly, it costs the American people over $500 billion a year just in compliance costs alone. It is this acid that is eating away at our society. And I'm sure that we all can agree that the current system is beyond fixing. And I also believe that we all agree that we need to fund our government with a tax that is fair, constitutional, and simple. A tax that is honest, pro-work, pro-savings, pro-growth, and pro-American. And we at the Americans for Fair, uh, for fair Tax have just a tax, and it is called the Fair Tax. And under the Fair Tax, there would be no federal income tax, no payroll tax, no self-employment tax, no capital gains tax, no gift or estate tax, no alternative minimum tax, no corporate tax, no payroll withholding, no taxes on social security benefits or pension benefits, no personal tax forms, no personal or business income tax record keeping, no personal income tax filing whatsoever, and no IRS. To summarize, if passed into law, the fair tax plan would enable workers and retirees to receive 100% of their paychecks. Replace all federal income and payroll taxes with a simple, progressive, visible, efficiently collected national sales retail tax. Rebate to all households each month the federal sales tax that they pay on the basic necessities, food, clothing, and shelter. Collect the national sales tax at the retail register just as 45 states do already. Set a federal sales tax rate that is revenue neutral, thereby raising the same amount of tax revenue that the, the is currently raised by the federal income tax plus payroll withholding taxes. Continue Social Security and Medicare benefits as provided by law, only the means of tax collection would change. It would eliminate the IRS and all audits of individual taxpayers. Only audits of retailers would be needed, greatly reducing the cost of enforcing the federal tax code. It would allow states the option of collection the collecting the national retail sales tax in return for a fee along with their state and local sales taxes. Collect federal taxes from every retail consumer in the country, whether that citizen is documented alien or which, he, which would increase our, our tax base. It would collect the federal sales tax on all consumption spending on new final goods and services, whether the dollars used to finance the spending are generated legally, illegally, or in the underground economy. Dramatically reduce the federal tax compliant costs paid by businesses, bring greater accountability and visibility to the federal tax collection, and attract foreign investment to the U.S. as well as encourage U.S. firms to locate new capital projects in the U.S. that might otherwise go abroad. It does not tax education because that is defined as an investment, not a consumption. If you've seen the fair tax video, which was playing earlier, you know it's simply a consumption tax. It taxes anything you consume, but only once and only on new items. The actual tax is minimal when you take in consideration that as a result of the fair tax, just about everything you purchase would come down in cost. This is because the fair tax would eliminate all embedded cost, tax cost. The fair tax is projected to be about 23%. It could actually be less according to some economists. What is important to remember here is that everyone will be paying into the system. The fair tax will draw revenue from all consumption activities, and this means no more argument over illegal immigrants not paying taxes. They will pay taxes just as everyone else does now. It even brings the money spent by criminals into play. Not <clears throat> now when that drug dealer buys that $200,000 Mercedes, he will be paying into our Social Security. Visitors to our shores will be paying into our Social Security, as well as helping fund our other government uh, uh, functions. Now I want to tell you something. I don't claim to be the most intelligent person in the world.
I do have the ability to read. I do have the ability to question. I do have the ability to take what I, to take things in and make a decision for myself.